Howdy. This video is on the energy of electron orbitals in atoms. To understand atoms, molecules, and chemical reactions, we have to understand how electrons are distributed in atoms and molecules and their relative energies. The difference in how elements behave is due to their electron configuration, which electron orbitals are actually occupied. After watching this video, you should understand that the energy of electron orbitals is dominated by the electrostatic interaction between the electron and the nucleus. You should understand that the electrostatic interaction depends on the distance between the electron and the nucleus and the amount of shielding. You should understand that the lower the energy, the more stable the orbital, and the more stable the orbitals, the more stable orbitals are filled first. You should understand that the order of the orbitals are filled and how it is related to the periodic table. It's really kind of cool. Using the periodic table, it can easily determine the electron configuration of atoms in general. And so the energy of the or electron orbitals actually depends on electrostatic interaction. The electrostatic interaction, you have two charged particles, opposite charged particles attract, like charged particles repel. Now, electrostatic interaction follows Coulomb's law. F equals K, a constant we're not going to really worry about, times charge on particle 1, charge on particle 2, divided by the distance between the two particles squared. And so, the bigger the charge, the stronger the interaction. The shorter the distance, the stronger the interaction. The electrostatic interaction is essential for understanding the energy of electron orbitals, the size of the atoms and ions, reactivity of atoms, interaction between molecules. A lot of chemistry is just about the electrostatic interaction, and so it's important that we have a thorough understanding of it. The stronger electrostatic attraction, the lower the energy, the more stable. And so you have opposite charged particles. The stronger the attraction, the lower the energy, more stable. The stronger the repulsion, the higher the energy, the less stable. And so for electron orbital, we saw that each orbital has a unique set of three quantum numbers, n, l, m sub l, and n was the principal quantum number, and it kind of denotes the size. The smaller the n, the smaller the size of the orbital. The smaller the size of the orbital means the closer the electron density is to the nucleus, and hence the stronger electrostatic attraction between electron and nucleus, and the lower the, lower the energy of the orbital, the more stable. And so that's why for all atoms, the 1s orbital is the lowest energy and the most stable, because it's the closest to the nucleus. The larger nuclear charge the electron sees, the stronger electrostatic attraction between the electron and the nucleus, the lower the energy, the more stable. Now, when we talk about nuclear charge the electron sees, it can depend on two things. The number of protons in the nucleus. And so as you go from left to right across the bracket table, you know, the number of protons in the nucleus increases by one. The other thing is what's referred to as shielding. And so if there is electron density between the electron density and the nucleus, and then the inner electron density kind of shields the outer electron density. And so the outer electron density does not see all of the nuclear charge. And so we can kind of use the flow chart. The smaller the end, the closer the electron is to the nucleus, the stronger electrostatic attraction between the electron and the nucleus. The more protons in the nucleus or the less shielding, the larger the effective nuclear charge, the stronger electrostatic attraction, the stronger electrostatic attraction, the lower the energy of the orbital, the more stable the orbital. And so if we imagine that we had an electron nucleus infinitely far apart, and so they were not interacting, we could imagine that energy to be equal to zero. Now, as the electron nucleus come together to form an atom, we're getting a more stable configuration. Again, the stronger the attraction, the uh, more stable. And so energy would actually be released when an atom is formed. And again, please remember, the stronger electrostatic attraction, the lower the energy, the more stable. Now, if we have a single electron atom, the energy of the orbital depends only on the shell. And so for a single electron atom or ion, like hydrogen atom or helium plus one ion, lithium plus two ion, the 2s and 2p orbitals have the same energy. 3s, 3p, 3d orbitals have the same energy. And so energy over the orbitals depends only on n. Now, when we have a multiple electron atom, then we start getting shielding. And so because the s orbital is closer to nucleus than the p, it gets shielded less. And so the S is less lower in energy than the P, lower than energy in D, lower than energy F, 
in any particular shell. And so the graph on the left, you see that you have the 3S is lower than 3P, which is lower than 3D, which is lower than, actually there's no 3F, but you get the, get the point. And so the graph on the left is typical for the orbitals and it comes from two things. One, smaller n, closer electron density to nucleus, more stable. And the other thing is from shielding, we know the S in a shell is lower than the P, which is lower than the D, which is lower than the F. And you combine those two things, you get the graph on the left-hand side. In the modern theory of the hydrogen atom, or any one electron ion, all subshells with the same principal quantum number n have the same energy. Theory tells us, however, that in atoms containing more than one electron, the repulsive interactions of the electrons with one another cause subshells of the same principal quantum number to differ in energy. The one electron in the hydrogen atom in its lowest energy, or ground state, occupies the 1s orbital. In helium atomic number two, there are two electrons. Where does the second electron go? The first rule is that electrons occupy the lowest available orbital. The second rule follows from the Pauli exclusion principle. Any orbital can hold at most two electrons of opposite spin. These rules tell us that in helium both electrons occupy the 1s atomic orbital. With increasing atomic number, the electrons occupy orbitals of increasing energy. With carbon, we encounter a new question. Because there are three degenerate 2p orbitals, that is, orbitals of equal energy, Hun's rule tells us that with two or more orbitals of the same energy, we should place electrons singly in each, with parallel spins until all are half full. With nitrogen, we arrive at a half-filled subshell. A half-filled subshell is associated with special stability. As we come to oxygen, having used up all the vacant 2p orbitals, we must pair electrons. With neon, we come to the end of the first row of the periodic table and the stable octet of electrons in the outermost shell. And so again, only, only, only for a single electron atom or ion, the energy of the orbitals depends only on n. And so once you have more than one electron, you're going to have some shielding, and then the S and the P will actually be different energies. Now, it's actually going to depend on how many electrons you have, and so you'll see an energy level diagram that doesn't really change, but again, the energy level diagram is going to be different for different elements. And so for single electron atoms or ions, the smaller the end, the closer the electron is to the nucleus, the lower the energy, the more stable the orbital. Once we get to multiple electrons, we can get shielding. Now the S is closer to the nucleus, so less, S is shielded less than P, which is shielded less than D. And so S is going to be lower in energy um, than P than D in any given shell. And so the energy for an electron completely separate from the nucleus is going to be very high um, and unstable. And so once you have an attraction, the stronger the attraction, the more stable. Now electrons are assigned to the orbitals with the lowest energy first. Lowest energy is the most stable. Now also please remember that, so an orbital has a unique set of three quantum numbers, N, L, and M sub L. An electron and atom has a unique set of four quantum numbers, N, L, M sub L, and M sub S. Now M sub S can have two values, plus or half or minus a half. And so in the description here where we have the arrows, one arrow, uh, arrow up can represent plus a half or minus half, arrow pointing down would actually represent the other one. Now because M sub S can have two possible values, each orbital can hold a maximum of two electrons. And that's referred to as the Pauli exclusion principle. Now notice on nitrogen, you have three electrons in the 2p orbitals. Now Hund's rule says that when the orbitals have the same energy, you give them their own orbital um, whenever you can. And so instead of it putting two electrons in one orbital and one in a second orbital, we give each of the three 2p electrons their own orbital. That's a little bit more stable. And I also found that nitrogen, having half-filled subshells, 
is a little bit extra stable. And so we'll see later that in terms of product trends, nitrogen usually violates the product trends because of half-filled subshells a little bit extra stable. Now, half-filled subshells a little extra stable, full shells are extra stable. And so noble gases have full shells, they're non-reactive, they're extra stable. And so this is a really kind of cool movie that shows you the energy levels for the orbitals um, as a function of the element. Now on the left, you actually do have, that's an absolute scale. And so it's kind of cool, as you go down the product table, what you're seeing is that that 1s orbital is going lower and lower and lower. And that's because the more protons in the nucleus, the stronger the attraction, the stronger attraction, the lower the energy of the orbital. But the, the diagram you're seeing changes for the different elements because you have a different number of protons in the nucleus, and you also have a different number of electrons, which yields, leads to a different amount of shielding. And so if we look at three noble gases, helium, neon, and argon, and so for helium you have 1s2, neon you have 1s2, 2s2, 2p6, and argon 1s2, 2p6, 2s2, 2p6, 3s2, 3p6. Um, so they have completed subshells of electrons. The radial electron density corresponds to the probability of finding an electron at a particular distance from the nucleus. We find that for helium, the radial electron density has one maximum at about three-tenths angstrom radius. For neon, however, the radial electron density has two maxima and one rather close to the nucleus, the second much further out. The first maximum is due in large part to the 1s electrons, which are drawn in close to the nucleus. The second maximum is due largely to the electrons with principal quantum number equal to 2. With argon, there are three maxima. The first maximum is due largely to the 1s electrons, which are pulled very close to the nucleus of charge plus 18. The second maximum is due largely to electrons with principal quantum number 2. And the third maximum is due largely to electrons with principal quantum number 3. These maxima correspond to Lewis's idea of shells of electrons. However, the shells are diffuse and overlap. And so it's kind of cool. Notice that the electron density is very diffuse. And also notice that for helium, so the 1s is, that would be about maximum of 0.3. For neon, it's going to be at 0.05. And argon, it's actually even closer to the nucleus. And so the first shell gets squeezed. It gets actually smaller as you go down the product table. Kind of consistent with when we saw the electron, the um, energy diagram, we saw the 1s going down because we had more protons in the nucleus. Well, the energy go down is because more protons in the nucleus, but also the electron density actually gets closer because the electrostatic interaction between electrons and the nucleus actually gets stronger. They're kind of cool. And so which 1s orbital has the lowest energy? So it should be the 1s orbital of argon has the lowest energy. And so electrons fill the lowest energy orbitals first and fill the orbitals according to both Pauli's rules and Hund's rule. Again, Pauli says that at a maximum, you can have two electrons per orbital. Hund's rule says that when the orbitals have the same energy, you give each electron their own orbital as long as you can. The energy of orbitals is dominated by electrostatic interaction between electrons and nucleus. And so the larger the effective nuclear charge, the stronger electrostatic attraction, the lower the energy, the closer the electrons are to the nucleus, the stronger electrostatic interaction, and the lower energy of the orbital. Again, that's why the 1s orbital is the lowest energy orbital for all atoms. The lower the energy orbital, the more stable. And again, we can use this um, flow diagram to kind of understand that. There's really only two contributions, n and the effective nuclear charge. The effective nuclear charge is affected by both the number of protons in the nucleus as well as how much screening you have. And so this is the general uh, energy diagrams for the orbitals. And so you can see it goes 1s2, 2s2, 2p6, 3s2, 3p6, 4s2, 3d10, 4p6. And again, this combination of two things, the smaller the end, the closer, the stronger the attraction. And in terms of shielding, 
in a shell, S is lower than P, which is lower than D. Now, combining these two things, we notice that often the 3D is lower in energy than the 4P. Now, there are exceptions to this, di this diagram, and remember, for each atom, each element, this diagram is going to change. Also, if you add or remove electrons, the relative energies of these states are going to change. And so the exceptions for that general diagram would include these elements in the red. I hope that was helpful.